How many of you all love taxes and finances and financials and all? Get out of here, you're lying. Nobody likes that stuff. Um, our next speaker met him, it's funny enough, I actually met him, uh, we, we, you know, we've, we've done some of these masterminds and workshops, so I met him on one we did in Maui, and uh, I was sitting there talking to him, we were climbing this crazy mountain thing, it was beautiful up there, I was talking to him, and I was like listening to his story, he was telling me about all his experience and everything, and I started thinking, I was like, what are you doing here? Because like, he has done a lot of stuff. He's been around the block. He's seen business. He's seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's built physical products, businesses to $75 million. Um, he's been sourcing from China for years and years and years, uh, and he really knows his business. And he's got a lot of great perspective. I and mean, when I was asking you about the finances and taxes and all that, I've gotten advice from him on that stuff because, I mean, he's in our shoes too. He's not some like, you know, guy who's like, oh, I just love operations and finances. <laughs> he knows it's a part of business, and so he's found a way to make it happen. And so he's going to give us a lot of perspective on what it takes to scale a business and keep this thing going for the long term, because we all have a lot of strategies and tactics now. Now he's going to help give you and us a really good perspective, because I'm going to be sitting back there taking notes myself. I've learned a whole lot from him. This is a huge treat for us. Let's give a huge hand to Steve Simonson. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, I know a couple people. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you to uh, Matt and Jason. And gosh, I was getting excited when I heard this new crazy good speakers coming up, and then I'm like, oh, no, it's me. Uh, so let me just have you pump the brakes on your expectations uh, a little bit. Okay, so what are we looking at on the screen? Can you tell me? Okay, so uh, thank you for that, by the way. Uh, a little bit of business. Gosh, that carpet is a long ways. I should have never ran. Um, okay, so listen, I don't do public speaking. This is not my thing. So I ask some experts, right? So I ask Matt and Jason, hey, what should, how do I get the crowd on my side? You know, I need to bond with these guys. And they said, you know, you got to tell a joke. Now, anybody who knows me knows I'm a very serious person. <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> this is, I'm the talker, no talking. <laughs> I'm a very serious person, and uh, so they said, don't worry about it. We saw your opening slide. We'll write the jokes for you. I said, thank you. This is what the kind of guys they are. They're givers. So, uh, so this, is, this is the first joke, and this is provided by Jason Katzenbach. You can send him your, your uh, rating on this on Yelp. So he, what does a lion say to his pride before they go hunting? Let us pray. Huh? <laughs> All right, Jason, yeah, you did pretty well. Uh, all right, so thank you, thank you. Um, second one, this was provided by Matt. What do you call a lion's reflection? All right, nobody? A copycat. <laughs> you got to hit the copycat there. So th there's the jokes. The rest is going to be serious. And I don't want any chicanery out in the audience either. I hear a lot of laughing over here. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, I do want to say, you know, thanks to Matt and Jason, hashtag sarcastic, uh, for those jokes. And uh, I actually, I also asked Mike McClary for some help. I said, hey, Mike, you've done this, you've done this. What's, you know, give me some suggestions. How do I reach out to the young people? And he says, listen, the millennials, these are the guys who are doing stuff there in the audience. You need to really connect. So you got two choices. You get a man bun and skinny jeans. He was looking right at me in the eye, by the way. So, I, what kind of guy is this? Or he said, you got to drop some hashtags. Because other, I, my understanding is millennials, they can hear a few sentences in a row, but then they have to follow it with a hashtag. Otherwise, there's no comprehension. So thank you. Thank you, McClary, for the hashtags. And if there's any length of time, thank you. Yeah. Well, I won't slow down for your applause because uh, i got a lot to say, and I'm the only one who may want to hear it. But either way, we're going to say it. Okay, so my first title, so my presentation topic is seven secret success strategies. Now, I have to say secret, and I look both ways because I don't want to get out too big. But really, it's, they're not so much secret. The, the, the first title was the not so obvious but critically important ideas to build a successful, sustainable, long-term business that can create wealth and happiness, but it'll take time and hard work, but maybe not as hard and as long as you think, strategies. 
Man, you should have seen how that slide looked. It did not work. So I just went with secret. Uh, I do want to take one minute just for you guys to mentally recognize yourselves. So it costs money to get here, tickets and airplanes and hotels and whatever. I don't really care. That's fine. We all have to pay money. That's life. But what I care about is the time you put in. Okay, it's time. You can't buy more time. Anybody figure out a way to buy time? Because I'm all in if you do. Time is the absolute most precious commodity you have, and you've chosen to spend it right here. And life screeners, same thing. You're, you're investing time in this process. How people spend their time tells me everything I need to know about somebody, right? Everything I need to know, I know now because you guys are in here. You're spending your time the right way. All right, so I'm going to see what happens when I hit this green button. All right. So if you ask people, hey, what do you know about me? They would probably say I'm old. And I remarket that into experience, right? And by the way, at first it just said experience. And I think uh, my buddy Rich Henderson may have had his hands in this. So <laughs> he's a funny guy. Now, listen, I love Rich. He's brilliant. He's a scholar. He's a great teacher. But he's got a mischievous side to him, doesn't he? Right? We all kind of know this. And he messed up with this slide. I shouldn't say old there. Experience is probably something that people would say, uh, people who know me. And I'm going to just give you a few little data points. It's, it's not even a humble brag. It's just to go, hey, here's some context for what I'm telling you, where I've come from. Maybe you care, maybe you don't. Either way, I'm going to just tell you and share it with you. So over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, this is my 29th year owning my own business, by the way. 29 years own my own business. My last real job, by the way, is I was a janitor. I was very poor, and I was in Idaho, going to Idaho State College. This is in 1988. And, uh, and I dropped out because I was too poor, and I hated it. And the janitorial career wasn't taking off, surprisingly. And, <laughs> uh, and by the way, I would go out at night and, uh, you know, do what janitors do, scrub toilets and the like. But my sweet little grandmother, who I was living with at the time, she confided in my aunt that I think Steve might be a drug dealer. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying is what you have in front of you is a, jan a failed janitor college dropout possible drug dealer. <laughs> now... Uh, over the, the last 15, 20 years, I've sold 250 million plus of B2C commerce, mostly e-commerce, online stuff. I've done another 500 plus million in B2B sales, uh, wholesale things, selling Office Depot, Big Box, this and that. I've scaled organizations to 500 employees uh, and beyond. Multi-countries, we had offices of the Philippines, 100 people. I've had uh, big operations kind of in the UK and, and, and done things in China for many, many years. I've done 100 plus million dollars worth of deals, buying and selling businesses, capital transactions, fundraises, et cetera. So my point is I've been around the block. Just in January of this year alone, my team, along with one of my partners, we probably landed in January 120 to 140 containers. Just in January, right? So when I talk about the lessons, the seven secret success strategies, all of these things I think are absolutely critical to what what we've put together, right? If it's success or not, uh, somebody else can decide. My mission is to help entrepreneurs kind of create their own path to whatever existence they want. Whatever they choose to have, they should be able to find their way, right? And so if I can help anybody save a, a few scrapes and bruises, uh, and believe me, most of my stuff is bruises. So I am experienced. Uh, I also, I'm a little bit of a class clown. Wait a minute, Rich. Class clown, oh, gosh, he's killing me here. All right, we're gonna just skip by that. So fundamentally, I believe I'm an entrepreneur. I love entrepreneurs. I believe the world needs more entrepreneurs. I think that entrepreneurs solve problems. They don't make problems, right? Everybody in this place, not, you're changing the world, right? You have the potential to change the world. I know there's a lot of guys starting out. But entrepreneurs, they're not a tax on the system. They don't take away, they add. And that's what I love. And that's why I love to be identified as an entrepreneur. And, you know, I, I think that any legacy I have, they can chisel on my tombstone, right? That maybe at first they'll say maybe 
uh, extraordinary father, right? Maybe world-class lover. And then they can drop on uh, entrepreneur. That was self-serving, I'm not gonna lie, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see what happens next when I click this. Oh yeah, so I was arguing with Rich about messing with my slides, and at first, this is how it went down. I said, Rich, I heard you're speaking. I'm sending my heartfelt love and wishing you the best during the upcoming event. And then Facebook says, start a plan. I don't know what that means. So this is me saying, Rich, I love you, right? And I do. Rich then starts taunting me and saying, I'm gonna mess with you. I'm gonna cut your mic. You're gonna have to mime the whole presentation. Maybe the lights go out. Who knows what happens? And I'm a little scared. And then he says, don't worry, I'm gonna target McClary. And I'm, I feel a little relieved, to be honest. But then I say, no. I believe Mike McClary is an entrepreneurial hero and any attack or disrespect towards him is like an attack on freedom itself and I'll fight for freedom. Assuming it's a dance fight. Uh, now, in fairness to me, I watched a lot of West Side Story and my understanding is we could work out our troubles uh, with fine choreography and up-tempo music. So, right, right? Uh, by the way, I can't actually dance. Maybe the icky shuffle, but that's all I got. But here's a, this is an important tip. You write this one down. If you're in a very um, difficult dispute or tense situation, number one thing to do, you got to exert dominance. Okay? So I follow up this message with, I'm watching you, Rich. And you do that through an emoji. Okay? So now he knows he's on alert. But Rich doesn't back down. He says... I got a good relationship with the production teams. Your slides could be a risk. And by the way, I didn't, this is not edited. This is all real. I say, I don't need your help. I'm going to add a password. Uh, by the way, I can't do air quotes. I'm like, uh, so help, uh, I'm air quote impaired. Uh, but I say, I'm going to avoid your help. He's like, ah, they can figure something out, LOL. That's not a laughing line. That's like a Bart Simpson, ha <laughs> ha, right? You guys probably didn't know LOLs had different sounds, but that, that's a heh <laughs> And so I say, kind of like Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, nerds, right? I don't know what to do. And then he gives another LOL, but this is not a Bart Simpson LOL. This is a, uh, a Vincent Price at the end of Thriller, mwah ha 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 ha, right? I can't do it like Vincent Price, but that's that kind of LOL. So obviously I'm terrified, and you can see he got to call me an ass clown on stage. Thanks, Rich. All right. Study this slide, raise your hand when you can read it. Okay, so everybody should be able to read this. Uh, what, what Cambridge University told us is they said, hey listen, put the last letter and the first letter in the right spots, the rest of the letters, you can jumble them up, they need to be correct, but the brain's gonna decode that for you. The brain's really awesome, it'll fill in the pattern, you don't have to worry. And so all you guys can read that, even though it doesn't make sense. Do you think a computer can read that? Right? A computer can't read it. So the brain is super awesome. It fills in patterns. Holy crap, that's awesome. All right. Now, read this out loud to your neighbor next to you. Okay. Now, let's read it together. A bird in the, the bush. Huh? So 72% of people don't see the second the. And I'm not just saying they don't say the second the. Your brain actually blocks it out. It's visually not there. Can you imagine? Your brain's doing all this work and it's all on autopilot. Right? So how awesome is that? First it's filling in patterns, then it's taking away redundant info. We should just go on autopilot all the time, right? <laughs> That's how I do it. Uh, all right. So I'm going to give you 15 seconds for this next little bit and I want you to read this slide. It's in English. And I'm, I want you to look and count the letter F. St. Lucia, keep it down over there. Let's not... Count the letter F as in Frank, okay? By the way, this is a trick. This is a trick. So I'm giving you fair warning, give you about 15 seconds. And it starts now. And my understanding is whoever gets this right, Matt's going to give $100 gambling tokens to the win or the Venetian, wherever we are. So talk to Matt about that. He may, he may play coy at first, but uh, he'll pay. I might hum the, the Jeopardy song here just for a minute, but let's see if I can go back one. All right. All right. Now, I want, this is audience participation time. Go ahead and stand up if you saw at least one F. Just, yeah, this is standing. We all have done this. You got here by walking and standing. 
Okay, most of you guys, right? You should at least see one. If you, stay standing if you saw two Fs. Go ahead and sit down if you didn't. Stay standing if you saw three. Stay standing if you saw four. Stay standing if you saw five. Stay standing if you saw six. Stay standing if you saw seven. Okay, so I, I did the math on that. Uh, by the way, there's still some of you guys up at seven. There were not seven. <laughs> um, but the guys who are down at four and five who are looking around going, what are these people watching? Right? And but how many of you guys, I'm going to read it backwards so that my brain doesn't mess me up. Did anybody do that? I'm reading it backwards because I'm going to outsmart this whole operation. All right. So let's, we got to go to this one. And now we're going to count them together. So there's one. There's two, there's three, most, everybody gets those. There's four, there's five, and there's six. Who's surprised? Oh yeah, you should be surprised. Now, about, uh, I think it's 82% of people won't get all six Fs the first time they see this. All right, so now what does this tell us? I just told you the brain's super awesome because it fills in patterns where they don't exist, it takes away redundant extra information, and now I'm telling you, your brain's defective, you can't even... Tell me the letter F. <laughs> now, just why does it do it? Because when you read that, you say of in your brain. And your brain goes, V is a V. These are not the Fs you're looking for. Right? <laughs> so don't trust your brain. Forget the autopilot. And my, my core message here is you're, you're beyond literate. But something this simple can mess up your brain. So the obvious, what's right there in front of your eyes and your mind, what you think is so clear there may be more than meets the eye. So whether it's this presentation or this entire event or anything you do, you should approach it with, maybe I don't really know. All right, yeah, that's right, maybe you don't know. All right, so this, just so, so you know, this is how I approach everything. I don't know nothing about nothing. And I say that so often I made it my axiom number zero. And what I mean is I, I really have to go into a, a room and I have to try to set my assumptions to the side. I have to try to stand down from my, my biases and my beliefs, and I have to learn. And that's all of you when you signed up for ASM said, I'm here to learn. And I want you to kind of think of that idea. Maybe, maybe you don't know nothing about nothing, but you're willing to learn and figure it out. And I'm just like you. But I really want to see if you're my people. So uh, again, last part of the audience participation, but go ahead and stand up. Now, I could do this as a kind of a Jeff Foxworthy. You might be a, a redneck kind of, you might be an entrepreneur if you've ever felt isolated or alone. Go ahead and stand up if you like that, or if you felt like that. If you've ever been stuck on a problem and didn't know what to do, go ahead and stand up. If you've ever felt like things were moving so fast, they're out of control, go ahead and stand up. Have you ever wondered if people realize that you don't actually know what you're doing? <laughs> stand up, right? That's what Matt talked about, imposter syndrome, right? And if you've ever had an unwelcome business surprise, go ahead and stand up. And by the way, if you're not up right now, you do business on Amazon, you are not paying attention. Uh, and then finally, stay standing if you, if you wonder if your business is real. Right? Do you ever look around and go, I don't know when the rug's coming out from under me, but I like it so far, but I'm really kind of nervous, right? So look around at all your fellow entrepreneurs. You're all the same, you're my people, you're each other's people, right? And give yourselves a, a, a hand, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. All right, uh, a note to the tech team, hopefully we got some tight shots on the audience standing with the applause and we'll splice that in at the end. I, I do have to take a minute, you know, on the way in, I had to run to the restroom and uh, the, as I'm coming out, uh, and it was just before I was heading on stage, it says employees must wash hands. And I waited a good five, 10 minutes and nobody showed up. And so I had to come on stage. So I don't know, I don't know if matter, Sophia the Great wants to talk to the Venetian or I can put it in my Yelp review, but their employees are not in there washing my hands. And by the way, on the unrelated note, I had to adjust my mic to the tech team. So maybe a vat of Purell or something. Maybe you just throw the thing away, I don't know. I often say how lucky I am, and I genuinely feel lucky. I really do. Who wouldn't, right? But it's, it's not really luck. It's the result, 99% of it is the result of extraordinarily hard work, right? And gut-wrenching risks. That's really where it comes from. 
And by the way, you know, a funny side note, remind me to tell you about the time I lost $60 million. It's hilarious. <laughs> the point is, if you're not willing to take risks, if you're not willing to say, I don't know nothing about nothing, if you're not willing to, you know, kind of work really hard, then it's going to be tougher for you. This is not, uh, entrepreneurialism is not for uh, people who are weak. All right, now this indelible image, which is now burned into your brain, should make you ask the most important question of your entire professional, personal uh, career, which is the why. Why are you doing this? Everybody's immediate gut reaction is, well, I'm doing it to make money. That's fine, everybody's gotta eat. But I'm, I want you to really talk about, this is success strategy number one, so write this one down. Your why is vitally important. If you're gonna launch a rocket, but you don't know where you're going, that rocket could be anywhere, right? So your why is, is you imagining what you want in your life. And I'm not just talking about business goals, your personal why. What do you want chisel on your gravestone? It's not how much money you have. That's, I'll just give you that clue. I know plenty of guys, 10 million valuation, or you know, net worth, 100 million valuation. I know some billionaires, their why is not about the money. And by the way, some of those guys are not incredibly happy, they're not fulfilled. Your why should be what fulfills you, what makes your life worth living, and then your business should serve that why. So often we reverse that. We say to ourselves, I'm gonna sacrifice, because I'm a, I'm a hard working, I'll do whatever it takes, right? And we, we kind of pride ourselves on how much we knock ourselves in the gut just to gut it out, right? And I'm not saying you shouldn't sacrifice, but I'm saying you should know where you're going. If you don't know your why, well, you're gonna waste some time. I didn't know my why for well over a decade. And let me just give you a, a quick story that, that when I didn't know my why and it was not awesome. Uh, and the point is to align your big picture strategy with where you're going. Right? So uh, back in the old days, uh, I had a partner and we had a carpet store and so we had no money, we were doing terrible and I'm like, hey Chris, we have no money to pay ourselves so here's a, here's a carpet job, go out and bring the deposit check so we can eat. And we weren't really gonna starve but we were, did not have any money. So Chris comes back, he's like, I got the job. You know, he's got the deposit. I'm like, let's hammer that deposit and go eat. And uh, he goes, just one thing, before they did the carpet, they wanted to do a chimney clean, so I told them we cleaned the chimney. The chimney, what? I don't know about anything about chimney, but I said, okay, fine, I'll hire a chimney guy, we'll clean the chimney, that would do the carpet, everybody's happy. Within a month, we're doing chimney cleaning so often, I hire a full-time chimney cleaner. Okay, so that's, uh, that's weird. Next thing you know, uh, he comes back, I got the hardwood job. Okay, great, Chris. He's like, just one thing. Uh, they wanted a fence built first, so I told them we'd build the fence outside. I don't know nothing about a fence, but I find some guys that build the fence. Within a year, we're doing decks, we're doing kitchen remodels, we're doing additions. We're, we're, so much so I had a full-time architect, I hired crews, all kinds of crazy stuff. But I tell you, it was chaos. He was out there, and if, if you said anything to him, he would say, yes, we'll do it. Oh, and then I had to cash those checks, right? <laughs> the people come in and said, hey, I want a, a deck cantilevered a thousand feet over this canyon. And, and Chris said you could do it. And I'm like, but physics says you can't. <laughs> Who might argue with physics? So the point is we wasted an awful long time spinning our wheels because we didn't know our why. We didn't have a big picture strategy. And I will guarantee every single one of you, the minute you lock down your why, and it ain't easy, the minute you lock down your why, you will be better off. Every decision will be a barometer against your why. It's a barometer, guidepost. Yeah, you fill in the blank. A benchmark, perhaps. If you can't measure every decision against your personal why, you're just not there yet. That's okay. It took me a long, long time. But I'm telling you right now, get it fast as you can. Most people don't know their personal why. That's okay, but you gotta get there. And your business serves your why. The business is a financial tool. It's not your baby. You're not sending it to college. You're not see little grand baby businesses, okay? A business is a financial tool, but many of you are in love with your, your business like it's a child. Don't do that. Okay, fail fast. Fail fast, fail often. You guys should already kind of understand that, that failure is not just an option, it's a necessity. 
And I know some of you guys are out here, oh, I'm a perfectionist. I'm going to find that perfect product and I'm going to launch it in 2027, right? <laughs> that ain't going to work. <laughs> so I can tell you, my, I, my first website went live in 1996. Uh, in my first secure shopping cart sale with encrypted cart and all that was in 1998, which was a big deal back then. And the first sale we got was like October 98, and it was an it was a, uh, area rug to Bulgaria. And man, we're high five and we're international. This is the coolest thing ever. Ah! And uh, of course, we were drop shipping at the time, so we called the supplier the next day. They're like, hey, it's back ordered. So we're sorry, customer, it's back ordered. So three weeks later, the rug comes in and um, we ship it off to Bulgaria, and the very next day, the fraud alert comes in the mail. Yeah. It was, a, it was a fake transaction fraud. So any normal person would go, this is a terrible thing. Let's shut her down, right? But we're like, this is exciting. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, I know, the wiring's messed up. But um, so flash forward to February, when we ship big ticket items. And we didn't know how much it cost to ship anyway. So we're like, let's just do free shipping. What do we care? Uh, <laughs> back in 99, a dot com didn't need to make money. That was irrelevant. So we're like, we'll just do free shipping. So we turn on free shipping on February 1st, 1999. February 14th, 1999, we're in a total meltdown. Total meltdown. We're out of stock. Stuff's getting lost. The attorney general in New Jersey bought a pallet of something. The shipper lost it. We're next day pallets around. We don't know anything. The entire thing is a disaster. And we did about $40,000 in those 14 days. We took the phone off the website. We stopped taking orders. It was a nightmare, and I loved every second of it. I failed as fast as I could, and, and it, all of those things, all those experiences proved that we're onto something. We didn't get it right, and by the way, I never got it right the first time. When I started computer programming in school, way back in the old days, they said, it'll never work the first time, and I'm like, that was my mission, to prove the teacher wrong. Oh, mine will work the first time, and never, ever, ever has one piece of code or one brilliant idea ever worked like I thought it would the first time. So just fail fast. Get it over with. Uh, failing along is inevitable and anybody who's trying to avoid failure, you're not really an entrepreneur. You're just scared. It's okay to be scared. By the way, fear is a part of it, right? Um, uh, Michael Bukowski's in the room. He's, he told me, I don't remember the guy, but you know, fear, this guy used fear as a tailwind. Right? Think of fear as your tailwind. Let it push you. Don't be afraid of it. Conquer it. Make it your little, you know, shotgun buddy. Whatever you want to do. But it's a part of this world that we live in. Um, Winston Churchill, one of my favorite quotes, he says, if you're going through hell, keep going. Right? Well, I wouldn't want to stop there. Uh, I should just point out, one of the most defining characteristics of an entrepreneur is your willingness to persist in the face of adversity. It's not how hard you work. It's not how many hours you put in. It's not all of those kind of things that sometimes we get mixed up about. It's your willingness to just keep going and just keep failing, falling down, getting back up. Steve Jobs said it, Warren Buffett said it, Bill Gates said it, and I certainly have lived it. If you keep going, it always gets better. So right after we uh, melted down, uh, we said we gotta build a system because you know this ain't gonna work. But it could work, but it, it hasn't worked. So we started building systems, and all of you have to build systems. Everybody in this room says, oh, I know I need systems. I, you know, who's got the SOPs for sale? I'll buy them. You know, that's not going to work entirely. Everything that you do, start with a simple flow chart. Just diagram your process. Don't start with the 10-page SOP. That's really hard, at least for me, to make. Start with a simple flow chart. Maybe you have a whiteboard. Maybe it's a piece of paper. It doesn't matter. Place a purchase order, uh, you know, in the system. S submit to supplier. Supplier returns purchase or pro forma invoice, right? The PI. Verify the PI. You know, either you have terms or you wire money. Every little thing, you just flow chart it. It's, it's extraordinarily simple if you just do it. And then over time, then you write the SOPs that match the flow chart. And of course, they evolve and get better. And then even over time, maybe there's some automation that happens. But the point is, without systems, you're not going to scale. And even if, you, even if your why is like, hey, I want a laptop lifestyle why. That's okay, no problem. Your why might be, I want to build an empire and go public why. Also, okay, no problem. I don't care what your why is. But you're going to need systems either way. 
So for the public guy, he's going to need systems because that's just the way it is. For the laptop lifestyle guy, you're going to need systems so that you have a life, right, so that you can live. So um, as we did that, we built systems. And uh, we'll flash forward uh, five or six years later. Uh, we, our business started to grow and we were doing okay. And uh, I remember in like January of whatever year it was, I said to the, I'm doing the CEO kind of, hey, we'll giddy up and go. We're going to have a great year. January, let's, let's get ourselves pumped up and here's our goals. And I, I laid down a gauntlet. And the gauntlet was, this year we're going to have our first million dollar day. First million dollar day. Now we had done... Regularly kind of five, hundred, six hundred, seven hundred thousand dollar days, but we hadn't crossed that threshold of a million dollars. And I was bummed about it, right? And so I said, hey, January, where I'm talking big, woo And then by September, I kind of forgot and realized we hadn't done it yet. So, uh, yeah, uh, hashtag note to self, right? Huh? Millennials are back in. Uh, so anyway, uh, so I, in September, I just, I bring in the leadership team and Brian Simonson, my brother and Theron Andrews, they were in there and I say, we're doing the million dollar day, November 17th. So let it be written. So let it be done. That's leadership. And then uh, by about October, I notice the vibe is not like these guys believe it's going to happen. Now, the marketing guys like Theron and Brian, they're, they're hustling the most and they're like, yeah, I'm optimistic. I think we're going to do it. But every other executive that I had, and we had probably a couple hundred employees by this point, 150, 200. But so these leaders that I'm talking to have to go spread the gospel to the people. And my own leadership team didn't really believe. They didn't really understand. So, but I'm like, it's happening. And, uh, and then I realized, I, by the way, I'd also scheduled a, a family vacation for that time. And so I'll be in Mexico. Good luck. <laughs> So what I did is I, we had a big whiteboard and I made everybody go write down their projection for that day. Now, when I have people write down projections, of course, we go by the standard showcase showdown Bob Barker rules, closest to the bid without going over. And there's some sort of little prize. But I'll tell you what, seven of my nine leaders, they put numbers below a million dollars. Six, seven, eight hundred, whatever it was. That's a failure of leadership, by the way. That's on me, not on them. So it was not super encouraging, but I'm like, hey, you know, let's get it done. Let's make it happen. So uh, long story, well, long at this point. Uh, I'm in Mexico. I'm watching the day. I'm calling in. How's things going? Pretty good. It's busy. It's brisk. Things are happening. Numbers are starting to trend in an interesting way. By the end of the day, we did $1.7 million. Huh? Yeah. Uh, and obviously, the team gets, uh, gets all the credit, but the, the, the lesson here is the systems. So uh, several years earlier, 40,000 over 14 days killed us. But here we were able to do 1.7 in a single day. Nothing broke. That was a fast pace. Things were moving. You know, we, we certainly, you know, hey, today's a busy day. The time's flying. But nothing broke. Right? And that's the dream. That's what you need in systems. So instead of being, I couldn't find chickens running around with their head cut off. That was a little gross. So I did the penguins. Have systems instead. All right. That. Um, okay. So entrepreneurs, uh, if you've ever had this feeling to yourself, you can raise your hand or you can just stay anonymous. But do you ever think if, if it's going to get done, I better do it myself. I do it better, faster, smarter. Right? A lot of us feel that way. Yeah. And... Uh, but you got this little buddy on the screen. He's, hey, I'm, I'll help. What can I do? Uh, systems is the first key to scale, and people are the next key to scale. And again, scale for those guys who want to go public and be super big, that's a, a different message. But scale to the guys who are laptop lifestyle still means you get to actually have the lifestyle. Your business carries on without you. You must delegate. Your average entrepreneur starting out, and certainly this was me, abdicates. I hate doing customer service, you do it, and never call me and talk to me about it. That's abdication. By the way, that never works long term. Never works. You'll go, oh, well, they, they're really good, and you pile more stuff on them because they're so good, and then over time, it, it doesn't work, for, and I could give you a number of reasons why. Don't abdicate, you delegate. Here's the system. The system's what's responsible. If there's a failure, it's not your people, it's your system and you're responsible for the system, look right in the mirror and go, do I have a system? Did the system produce the predictable result I expected? No, 
it's on me. How do we improve the system and you get your people involved? If you don't delegate, you're not gonna make it work. And I'll tell you what, everybody here thinks that you're smarter than everybody else, right? Come on, there's a few of you, right? Of course, you're the best of the best. And you have experience. I gave this to somebody and they weren't as good as me. But I'm here to tell you, somebody's always better than you. And you wanna find those people and you wanna hire them. And I'll give you a quick example. So uh, Brian, my brother, he was running our affiliate program and we had a few websites at that time. The average was about a million dollars a month each. So we go to Commission Junction, we're negotiating an affiliate deal. And I didn't have time. Normally I'm the negotiator, right? I'm tough, I'm, I know how to negotiate. I'm fair but tough and, and uh, they, if you ask them, they go, he's super cheap. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I didn't have time, so I'm like, Brian, you're just gonna have to handle this. So deal with it, I abdicated. But I'm gonna say it's delegation for this experience. And uh, their, their proposal was like 15 grand and, uh, and if it doesn't work, or, and it's a monthly fees, but really the 15,000 implementation was the problem. So he sends them kind of a, uh, uh, we'll give you three grand, you can take it or leave it, and then follow by a series of expletives. It, not, not really expletives, but it was, we'll give you three grand, take it or leave it. And I go to Brian and I'm like, geez, Brian, and negotiations a dance. They say 15, you say 75, they say 10, we say deal. And then we run out going, we save $5,000, right? And then, so I tell him, now I don't even know what to do. We have to wait for them to come back and we may have to eat a little crow. Because, you know, we did it in a way that didn't meet my own uh, biases and perceptions. So the next day or whatever, they send an email. Okay, yeah, fine, we're done. They took the deal. So the point is, I think I'm a great negotiator. He did it way better than I would have because he completely changed the paradigm that I have in my mind. And he saved us a lot more money. And I could give you countless examples of this. And you have to find these examples for yourself. If you don't delegate, you're going to just be a solopreneur, which means you own your job. There's no equity there. You're not creating wealth. It's tough. Now, you're in a really lucky business because you can do that and still sell the business, but you get a lot more, a lot better valuation if you have systems and people to run those systems. Take my word for it. Uh, all right, let's see what happens next. Okay, happy customers. Listen, you guys all know about this. Reviews matter, right? You want happy customers. But how many of you take the time to actually differentiate the experience? Oh, sure, you manage your reviews. We got some five stars, let's keep those going. Oh, we got a one star, let's talk to the customer, let's get more five stars. You're all about the reviews instead of about the customer experience. What are you doing different? What makes you special? You better figure it out because that's what happy customers come from. So I'm gonna have to pick up the pace, but um, I, I had a, a flooring store way back in the, the day and a customer came in and I was working that day and she says, and I know she has a carpet job or something. She says, hey, I was in here the other day. I was talking to Paul, one of the sales guys, and he gave me the name of a painter, but I forgot, can you get me the name of this painter? Now, in my mind, I'm weak, and I'm saying, what are we talking about paint? I don't sell paint. Well, I don't want to talk about paint. What? Paul, right? And, uh, but in professional, I'm like, yes, ma'am, let me go find out. So I'm in the back. I'm trying to find Paul's number in a Rolodex. <laughs> Write that one down, millennials. And there's probably a historical document about that. Uh, in the Rolodex, which is similar to your phone contacts list, uh, I find Paul, I call Paul, I say, what are you talking about, painters? Give me the name and I'm gonna yell at you tomorrow when you come in, click. And I run out, professional again. Yes, ma'am, here's the name of that painter waiting to now carry on a conversation. And she goes, right out the door, right? And I'm back, you know, Paul, man, he's gonna, I hate Paul. And... Uh, so I, I got nothing out of that transaction. And my brain is weak and I'm bitter. Uh, it wears off quick. So about a week later, she comes in and she says, here's, I'm ready for the carpet. It's like a ten or $15,000 job, beautiful job. And all's well that ends well, right? All's well that ends well. So I learned the lesson. Hey, maybe I should be a, a good customer service guy. A little postscript about a month later, she calls and goes, hey, you guys are so awesome at that carpet job. I'm building 18 condos in Bellevue. Would you like to do a bid? Yeah, I'll do a bid. Yeah, why not? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that bid's like $120,000. We bid the job. We get the job. We do the job. 
that project manager goes to another job. He goes, hey, I'm doing 38 condos. Would you like to do it? They're super high end. We bid the job, we get the job. That's $700,000 base contract. Another 700,000 of upgrades. That guy gets fired about midway. That's what happens in construction. They either quit or get fired midway. New project manager comes in. This guy goes and says, hey, I'm doing now 110 condos. You want to take a look? Million dollars. This guy, when he's done with the condos, goes to houses. I got 200 houses. You want to do it? Done. Two million dollars. Over the course of the next four or five years, I probably did somewhere between five and eight million dollars worth of jobs from this single lead. That lead changed my life. That lead, that, that single painter referral is what gave me the capital to be able to do the e-commerce company. It's what gave me the flexibility and scale to start learning and, and being ready to embrace opportunity when it showed itself. If you're not doing something super special, and I don't care about customer satisfaction. Can I just tell you that? Customer satisfaction means nothing. What you want to ask your customer is, would you recommend me to a friend? That's the only thing that matters. If they won't, because they'll go, yeah, yeah, I'm satisfied. But if they say, no, I'm not referring you to a customer, that is, that's the, the, the definitely a death knell. Uh, we ended up scaling a company and, and later I got an $88 million valuation on one of the companies when we were raising money. So it worked out pretty nice. Happy customers, relevant. All right, got a couple more here. Uh, you guys have already heard this from other guys, but thinking big is, is an important thing. It's easy to say it's hard to do. The thing that helps me is hearing others because they break my paradigm. I have these limits imposed, you all do. In your brain, there's some limit. You're like, man, if I could get to X amount, then I've, I've hit the home run. And it does, it's not just revenue, but it's a nice, easy milestone. But you all have these, it, right? Raise your hand if you, if you put some number, you're like, if I could just do this or sell for this, right? Oh, nobody has goals, nice. Uh, <laughs> no, fine, take a nap, I don't care. Uh, the point is, everybody's got some number that they go, then I'm successful. I jump over here, now I'm successful. And I had that number too. And Michael and I, we were stuck. We went to some investment bankers and we said, we did five million last year, we did six million this year, but we're stuck, it feels terrible. What do we have to do to be important to these investment bankers? And they say, you gotta do 25 million bucks. And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. that I, didn't even, I thought you were gonna say, you know, maybe get to 10 million over five years, but they're like, no, you gotta get to 25 million. So they broke our paradigm. They changed the way we had to think. And so we go back to Brian and, and some of the gang and we're like, well, we're spending, you know, um, 30,000 and we're getting 300,000 in revenue. Spending 30,000 on ads, 300,000 in a month on revenue. So let's spend 100,000 and see what we get. So we ramp it up, we spend 100,000, we get a million in the month of revenue. Spend 200,000 in the month on advertising, Google ads, we get two million in revenue, single month. 300,000, 3 million, 400,000, 4 million. I say, let's skip to the end. Leadership. <laughs> 750,000 we spent in one month, and we did 450,000. I wasted 250,000 by being stupid. Um, and by the way, what we, uh, two months later, we tried it again. We were like, ah, let's tweak it, let's get it ready. And two months later, we tried it again, another 750,000, four, four and a half million dollars in the month. So 500,000 in 90 days I wasted. And the, the point of this is we, again, not, not afraid to fail, not afraid to think big, but in this particular case, we reached the end of the efficient frontier of that marketing channel. So we reached the end of it. When you maximize a marketing channel, you can look it up on the, uh, the uh, internet. I've heard this exists. The efficient frontier. There's always a maximum level that you can spend on certain marketing channels, and it exists in every single one. By thinking big, it got, it got real. Okay, so the, a lot of you guys call yourselves entrepreneurs, and I agree with you. You're awesome. I love entrepreneurs. But the highest level of entrepreneur to me is an awesomer. Okay, an awesomer, they, they don't just say, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur and they're selling, you know, flowers on the corner or whatever. I, and I respect any entrepreneur, but an awesomer is somebody who takes it to the next level. Somebody who holds themselves accountable. Somebody who says, I'm here to make a difference in the world, right? That's an awesomer. And so this is some of the differences between awesomers. Awesomers own it. I made a mistake, but I'm going to get better and smarter. It's on me. Don't worry about it. 
Normies, by the way, I love normies. I got no problem with normies. Some of my friends and family are normies. No problem. But they tend to blame, they blame it. We own it, they blame it, right? Awesomers always do the right thing for the long term. Sometimes normies go, what's in it for me today? Awesomers make skills. Normies make excuses, right? You guys all know if you can't do the Facebook, you just got to get smarter, better, faster, whatever, and hire somebody. Normies go, I don't get Facebook, I'm out. We're talking about big picture, they're talking about big problems. And again, this is not a us versus them. A normie is a guy who's stuck in a toll booth but has no aspirations to ever change. He punches a clock, he's, he's taking the, I don't know, they just throw the stuff in, I don't even know what the guy does. But he's breathing in exhaust all day. He has no aspirations. You have dreams, yes? Yeah. I'm guessing, yeah, thank you. And fundamentally, you believe in yourself. You know that it's on you. So when you believe in yourself, that's better than believing in circumstances. Uh, oh, this politician or this circumstance or the weather was bad or whatever it was, that's why I can't succeed. That's just all crap. Just doesn't work. So uh, the abundance mentality is very clear in an awesomer's mind. Everybody in here is selling on Amazon. Oh no, my, my pie just shrank. Oh, right? That's, that's a normie mentality. No, the pie gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you add value. And when you do that, that's when you earn and win and so on and so forth. We believe in abundance. Normies are, are stuck in scarcity. Don't be stuck in scarcity. Uh, awesomers are all about revelry. At least I am. I like to have fun. And I'll tell you, you can write this one down. The secret to life is it's the journey, not the destination. Right? Yeah, that's right. The destination, by the way, is six feet under, so good luck to you. Uh, if you're, if you're hard charging to that, you're missing the boat. You better enjoy the journey. Revelry is amazing. And I, some of my best friends in the world and the, the best people I know in the world are from ASM and some of them in this room and we travel around the world and we have fun and we're building our businesses. Yeah, yeah, there's a couple of them. Yeah, there you go. Um, so uh, re revelry is relevant. You, you want to be a have, not a have not. You want to be a maker. You don't want to be a taker. We contribute. We're not going, who's going to come and give me the, the whatever I need to succeed. No, we're going to go make it and earn it and take it, all right? And that's the final thing. We're earners. We earn what we get. When people talk about the, the 1% being such scumbags and so forth, it's like, hey, you go talk to somebody else. I earned what I have, and you can earn it too. Fundamentally, whether you're a single person right now, you're still a leader and you're developing yourself to be a leader. And if you don't want to be a leader, pick a different business. You lead your vendors, you lead your staff, you lead your colleagues, you lead anybody you work with towards your goals. You must be a leader. And some of us are reluctant leaders. Anybody ever feel that way? I don't want to be the leader, right? Some of us are reluctant. I'm just telling you, get on board. You're a leader. Suck it up. <laughs> Suck it up. Okay. Uh, okay, we've covered these things. And I know, listen, I, if I was talking to my leadership team, we might do a day on each of these topics. And I had about four and a half minutes for each one for you guys. So we didn't get into the nitty gritty. But remember these concepts. Remember those photos burned into your brain, right? Thinking uh, big and failing fast and so on and so forth. Um, and don't forget to try to be an awesomer. That's the key. Now, I want to just give you a couple little bits of information here. First of all, you guys, this is going to go big. Remember, there is no you in yo. Yeah, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> Rich Henderson, he's my good buddy. I love him. I love Mike McClary and Jason and Matt and the whole uh, awesomer team at Amazing. They're really great. And so, Although this, I was actually his hostage at the time, developed Stockholm Syndrome, and that's the photo you see there. Uh, but no, I really do love him, and I, I tease him in good fun. So um, if you guys need some help, now I don't sell anything. I don't sell anything. If, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> uh, if you go to that website right there, it should say awesomers.com slash ASM. We'll send you 
a process to find your why. We'll send you a process to find your company story. We'll send you a finance 101. Like everybody in here is doing your own bookkeeping that's doing more than 10,000 bucks a month, you're wasting your time. We're gonna just send you stuff and we're, we'll drip it out to you because if I give it to you all today, you'll ignore it. And, uh, and we'll never ever sell anything. We may say, I'm not gonna do your bookkeeping for you, but we may say, here's a bookkeeper. I have no affiliate relationship. I don't make money on any of this. I just like to match awesomers with awesomers. Right? All right, so the last word here. There's a lot of people and they, they, they walk around, they're like, oh, did we miss the wave? Yeah. Is this thing over? Is the gold rush done? Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah, if you haven't, you're not paying attention again. But I'm, I'm gonna tell you this, and I have a lot of experience you are in the right place at the right time. You could not be in a better spot. You made an investment in ASM that was brilliant and you made a bigger picture decision to be an entrepreneur, change the world. This is so important, but don't think it'll be easy. It won't be. Don't think it's just gonna lay down and, and you know, say, yeah, here, you know, now all your dreams came true. You better fight for it. But the fact that you joined it and the fact this is the best time ever to be in the e-commerce business, ever. And I've been doing it for almost 20 years, e-commerce. I, w I wish I could have started now. You guys have it so freaking easy. <laughs> if you knew how many millions I spent on developing systems and ERP and this and that, and now you guys go on Shopify and 29 bucks a month, and then you're like, 29 bucks a month? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I had redundant servers and engineers and we're spending three million a year just to keep the website up and it's breaking all the time. And you guys are like, Shopify charged me, you know, whatever. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, you guys are killing me. <laughs> Don't forget, right place, right time. Be an awesomer. Don't stop it and be adequate, be awesomer. And my name is Steve Simonson. I love entrepreneurs and you're all awesomers to me. Yeah.